We just want to wa welcome uh, Dr. Marsha Malik here, who's visiting us from University of Wisconsin at Madison, although actually from New York technically this week. And uh, Dr. Malik is uh, the, uh, most recently the um, Vice Chancellor for Research at University of Wisconsin at Madison and previously the director of the Weissman Center there as well and has uh, numerous publications and awards and has um, really trained also some really uh, quite important influential people in the field as well. So her, so her influence extends just beyond, beyond her own work to the work of others as well who are really making a mark in the field. And so we're really grateful for you have spent a, having spent a couple of days with us and uh, I'll turn the floor over to you. So it's been a great couple of days, really great. The only regret I have is that um, it's only a couple of days. There's so much to talk about, and I've learned so much, and I'm so impressed with what I've seen. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be able to share with you this work that I've been involved with for the last few years. Um, about started out with Fragile X Syndrome, um, a study of family adaptation to Fragile X Syndrome, uh, a grant that we got in 2008. Um, uh, from as part of a center grant funded by the NICHD and it's one of those moments in time where your interests become uh, different than what you thought because uh, originally I was thinking about family adaptation to fragile X syndrome and all of a sudden my attention became riveted to the parent to the mothers the premutation carrier mothers of the children with fragile X syndrome which is what I'll be telling you about today um, because they too have a genetic variant um, that um, that I think warrants attention. So it was like a figure ground problem where initially I was focused on the individuals with Fragile X and all of a sudden they became the, not the figure but the ground and the mother became the, the figure. Um, so that's what I, I'm going to share with you. Um, so this is a family affected by Fragile X syndrome who we take care of at the Wasteman Center. The three children all have Fragile X. Um, the mother was uh, the oldest daughter was originally, I believe, diagnosed with autism and eventually got diagnosed with Fragile X after the second daughter was born and the mother was pregnant with the, um, the little boy. Um, and um, they're a beautiful family and uh, I'm so glad that they allowed us to use this picture because they just show the joy that families have at the same time that, and you can probably look into the children's eyes and have some observations to make. But what has happened during, um, since 2008, when I became interested in this, is I have learned about how, or I've become interested in about how a gene that we all obviously have and variants that exist across the population um, have much to teach us beyond Fragile X syndrome, although Fragile X syndrome is extremely um, interesting and important. So today what I'd like to do is just give you a brief overview of fMR1 genetics. Um, I'm a family researcher, I'm not a geneticist, so I apologize in advance. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the epidemiology of um, fMR1 CGGs ex expansions, the prevalence of expansions of um, CGGs in the fMR1 gene, and some work we've done on defining the premutation of the phenotype, and then just to share some insights about um, FMR, FMR1 gene variations. Um, so you all know, but I, I shouldn't even spend a slide on this, that Fragile X syndrome is the most common inherited cause of intellectual and developmental disabilities. It's passed from, in most cases, the mother who has the premutation to a child who has a full mutation of Fragile X syndrome. And it's caused by the silencing of the FMR1 gene, which is on the X chromosome. And um, Fragile X syndrome uh, manifests in both males and females, but it's much less severe in females because of X inactivation. And you see the symptoms listed there. All of them exist in females as well as males, but usually um, in much milder forms. And behavior problems are a significant issue with Fragile X syndrome, especially in males. And some estimates uh, made by my colleague Don Bailey are that a third of parents in each year, a third of parents of males with Fragile X are have to seek medical care for injuries as a result of the severe aggression um, of their sons um, in the home environment. So behavior problems and severe aggression is a major issue and it is um, the most common genetic cause of autism, or at least it's said to be that. A um, few words about um, the genetics. Um, 
FMRP is the protein made by FMR1, and it's a really sort of master protein in the brain. It regulates the synthesis of about 30% of all synaptic proteins, um, so it's a neurodevelopmentally important um, gene and um, protein, and then it also has a, um, a continuing impact on the functioning of the ner nervous system. So we think about the spectrum of CGG repeats in fMR1, and the spectrum that we most know about and we most think about is Fragile X syndrome, which is caused by um, more than 200 P CGG repeats in fMR1. But there is increasing interest in the premutation, um, and that is defined by 55 to 200 repeats. And then more recently, there has been some um, study of the gray zone, which is variously defined, but let's say it's the 41 to 54 CGG repeat range, and that's the range where there is some evidence of instability um, in the number of CGGs so that at 41 CGGs or more, when passed from one generation to the next, can expand, and increasingly we see that it can also contract. And so the number of CGGs not stably inherited once you get to 41 CGGs. But under 40 CGGs, it believed to be normal, and not much attention has been um, focused on that. Um, within the CGG tract, there are normally AGG um, triplets um, interspersed, and the AGGs are believed to stabilize the CGG tract. Um, the, the most prevalent in two cohorts that we've looked at, most prevalent pattern of um, CGGs around the mode in the population, which is 30 repeats, is 10 CGGs, followed by one AGG, followed by nine CGGs, followed by one AGG, followed by nine CGG, CGGs. And so that's the most prevalent pattern of CGG repeats, at totaling 30 repeats, which is a very large percentage of the population. And that's stably inherited from one generation to the next. But when AGGs are lost, that's believed to be the cause of the expansion and sometimes contraction that ultimately leads to Fragile X syndrome um, because the AGGs, when they're lost, the number of CGGs can expand across generations. And here is a published uh, data from a, published, a paper published in 2009 about a three-generation family, a grandfather, his daughter who's the mother of the child with Fragile X syndrome. So, the grandfather had 52 CGGs and two AGGs. So he was in the gray zone with 50, 52. His daughter, there was an expansion from 52 to 56 CGGs, but the two AGGs were lost and she had no AGGs. And her son, who's the grandson of the first guy, had 538 CGGs, no AGGs, and full Fragile X syndrome. So this is an unusual example because it happened rapidly in three generations. Usually the expansion happens much more slowly across the generations. But this is essentially the, what happens. So when I started getting interested in issues of prevalence of the premutation, um, there weren't any publications based on U.S. population data of the prevalence of the premutation. And there were some international um, reports, but um, there's a significant ethnic gradient in Fragile X syndrome and in the premutation logically that follows, where some ethnic groups have much higher prevalence of um, Fragile X syndrome than other ethnic groups, likely because of founder effects. Um, and so there were no population-based U.S. studies until 2012 when we published our paper, and another paper came out that um, uh, was published by Flora Tassone um, and Bondi Hodgman at the Mind Institute at UC Davis, as well as Don Bailey at North Carolina and um, Liz Berry Kravis at Rush University Medical Center, and our results converged. Um, what, some of the problems of previous estimates of the prevalence of the premutation were that it was based on biased sources of, of um, biased data. They either were testing pregnant women, and that's a problem because premutation carrier females have problems of infertility, so that would be a problem in estimating prevalence if you're focusing on pre pre pregnant women. Tests of leftover blood samples co collected for clinical purposes may also pr introduce biases 
screening of normal volunteers where anybody with a clinical diagnosis is screened out before they were screened. So all these available data pr potentially produced um, biased estimates of the prevalence. And so we went, we, these two papers came out in 2012, and I want to tell you a little bit about the work we did in publishing this paper, uh, the prevalence of CGG expansions in the fMR1 gene in a U.S. population-based sample. So it was based on a study that I'm going to come back to, so let me tell you a little bit about this study. It's called the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, and you probably have never heard of it, but it's an absolutely wonderful resource for a variety of types of research. And it is a random sample, a true random sample, of one-third of all high school seniors who lived in Wisconsin and were in school in 1957. And they've been followed ever since. Uh, we just got a new grant to study dementia in this population because they're now at the age where that's a reasonable thing to study. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about this, but they, in addition to 50, 60 years of data, there's DNA that's been banked for research purposes, and they're a very homogeneous population. It, like Wisconsin in 1957, it's um, essentially of all Caucasian population. Um, and as I said before, the, there's a significant ethnic gradient in um, the premutation. It's lowest in Asian populations and highest in Caucasians. Um, and so the WLS may be a useful um, source of data. It's a representative population. It wasn't collected to study intellectual disability. It was collected initially in 57 to study the transition of young adults into the world of work. So it had no sort of, and they were not volunteers. It was, these individuals were recruited in, before the era of IRB so that there was no consent or parental consent. The teachers put a mimeographed form in front of them and they said, fill it out, um, and they did. And about 80% of the surviving members of that cohort continue to participate. For those of you who, I said this last night too, but watch reruns on TV or know about old shows, the program Happy Days um, was about a high school in Milwaukee in 1957. No connection to the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, but for those of you who know what I'm talking about, that's, that's, the, pop, that's the generation. So WLS, Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, originally had, um, has been following 10,317 people who are in high school that year in 1957. They're born in 1939. It was, a, as I said, a one-third random sample of the full cohort. Actually, the full cohort was studied, but only one-third were followed up. And you see the points of data collection and the points in the life course when they were studied, when they were age 18, age 36, early 50s, mid 60s, and early 70s, and soon we'll be back with them again um, with a very large grant to um, to screen and screen for dementia and then image those neuroimaging on those who look like they need it. And then they also surveyed over almost 6,000 siblings of the graduates. Um, and so we have the possibility of looking within families at life course outcomes. The dir first director of the WLS, when he, shortly before his death, I met him, Bill Sewell. He was a sociologist, a demographer. And when he knew what I was doing with the WLS, he said never in his wildest dreams did he ever think the WLS would be used for the purposes that we have used it. So fortunately for us, um, w in those years, there was no special education, so everyone was socially promoted. And we're high school seniors even with IQs as low as 61, which was the floor of the test that was used. Because there was no IRBs, we have IQ scores on all of these people from their records as well as their um, academic records, what classes they took and what grades they got. There's equal numbers of males and females. And as I said, about 80% of the survivors continue to participate and there's DNA, so we could potentially use this to estimate the prevalence of a variety of things, but we were interested in the premutation, so that's um, what we were, what we did. Uh, WLS collected saliva in 2006 using origin kits. They just sent them to the participants, to the cohort, and about 7,000, just sent them back. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's great. And um, we extracted DNA from 67, 47 cases. And since then, they've collected more, and they're up to about 9,000 cases, and we're about to assay the other 2,500 cases about to um, complete the um, fmr one CGG repeat coverage in the WLS. And there was a small amount of bias in terms of who sent back their DNA. 
half year more education than those who didn't, three points higher in IQ and a higher high school rank, but otherwise they were representative of the WLS population, so we were pleased to see that. The assay was funded by the Centers for Disease Control. Changed my life to get that award. Um, and this is what we found. The range of CGGs, remember, the mode is 30, premutation is 55, um, was between 9 and 135. And when we tr translate that into prevalence estimates, it's 1 in 151 females and 1 in 468 males. They were all Caucasian. And then we also couldn't help ourselves but look at the gray zone, 41 to 54, and 1 in 13 females and 1 in 21 males. So when you start thinking about that prevalence, this is an, it, um, it, it is a, fragile X syndrome is a rare, rare syndrome, but when you start going through the spectrum, then it, it, uh, I, there's variants that are prevalent. Um, and as I mentioned, Flora Tassone led the publication of a newborn screening study in three states, California, Illinois, and North Carolina. And the prevalence that they reported in the Caucasian sample was similar to the prevalence we found at the other end of the lifespan for, um, in the WLS. And it was lower in the African American and uh, Hispanic population within the newborn screening study. Um, but if we try to make estimates, I think there's some grounds to estimate that about a million Americans have the fMR1 premutation, about 10 million are in the gray zone. Um, so there's a lot of controversy within the Fragile X world um, about whether there is a premutation phenotype. Is there a phenotype associated, clinical phenotype associated with the premutation? And the reason why there's controversy, of course there's controversy in any field, but the reason specifically here is because all of the premutation carriers are almost all the premutation carriers known in research were reverse ascertained when a child with Fragile X is diagnosed. So then there's cascade testing of the families and they are identified um, as whatever. Um, but the individuals who find their way to Fragile X clinics, because there aren't very many of them in the US, or to a clinical geneticist to diagnose the child, you know, they go through a diagnostic odyssey. They have, often have to have the means for transportation. They, you know everything that I don't have to even say it. It's potentially a biased sample. Um, and we may not know much about people who don't have children with Fragile X syndrome but carry the same um, variant gene genetically. And so the controversy is really is, you know, it ha do we know enough about the full population of the premutation to answer the question, is there a premutation phenotype? But in the early 2000s, um, Rondi and Paul Hagerman published data, which I think everyone, they said it was irrefutable evidence and now it's believed to be irrefutable evidence, I think, in the Fragile X community that premutation carriers have two syndromes um, with incomplete penetrance, so only in a portion of the people who have the premutation. One is called Fragile X-associated tremor ataxia syndrome, or FAXTAS, which is characterized in especially males, but also some females over the age of 50 who carry the premutation with executive function deficits, tremor, ataxia, neuropathy, brain atrophy, et cetera. Um, and females with Fragile X are known to have something called FAXPOI, Fragile X primary ovarian insufficiency, which is early menopause, but also some infertility and some severe menopause symptoms when, an atypical, very atypical menopause when, um, when they have FAXPOI. But then there's also clinical reports in the literature that premutation carrier mothers of children with Fragile X syndrome have elevated rates of anxiety and depression. Um, and other health problems, um, fibromyalgia, migraines, um, uh, um, autonomic disturbances. But these are questioned about whether this is due to the reactive effects of parenting a child as stressful as many children with Fragile X syndrome are, or are, is this the direct biological effect of the premutation that they carry? And so that's you know, of the controversies in the world, it's perhaps not the most important one, but it, it's, I think it's very important to resolve what's a normal variant versus what is um, a risk factor for some of these health um, and mental health problems, even though the level of effectiveness is not universal.
So these are all the challenges, or at least many of the challenges that we face in trying to sort out this puzzle, the wide range of, C the wide range of CGGs um, in the premutation, the variation in the number of AGGs in each individual who may have the premutation, there's the activation ratio in females, um, because there's, uh, I've never seen any data where there's, or any in individual where there are premutation on both alleles. So they're usually heterozygous premutation on one X chromosome and normal in the other. They're, of course, variable in their exposure to environmental stressors, both from the child with fragile X if they have one. It's generally the case that there's multiple affected family members, which is stressful. And then they are exposed to the range of stressful life events that we all are exposed to, and there's additional ones because of family effectiveness. So we're conducting this longitudinal study that I mentioned before that started in 2008 of premutation carrier mothers of adolescents and adults with fragile X syndrome. So these are just as biased as the other literature, um, but I'll show you some unbiased data as well. And the mothers in the study when we began 10 years ago were 51 years of age on average and their son or daughter with fragile X syndrome averaged 21 years of age. And you see that mothers, about a quarter, took psychotropic medications and um, a third were diagnosed with anxiety or depression. So it sort of fit that profile that Rodney Hagerman has published on. And they definitely had a high level of stress exposure, which I'll show you. Um, this is, one, is a pedigree of one of the families and it's not atypical. Um, so let me sort of walk you through this family. Um, uh, the the great-grandparents are Charlotte and Cooper who you know, they were just people who never heard of the gene or never thought about developmental disabilities in their family. And they had four children. Lucy on the left with a little tiny star up there, she was the respondent in our study. Um, and the code on the bottom shows that a red colored quadrangle, uh, quadrant is, um, the, she carries the premutation, but she didn't know it until her children were diagnosed eventually with fragile X syndrome, two of her three children have fragile X, the blue quadrant. One has autism, which is the little black dot. So when Lucy was di when Lucy's children were diagnosed, then they wanted to do cascade testing on the family. And she had three siblings, has three siblings, Lucas, Brooke, and Haley. And Haley got tested and she was found to have the premutation. And she has also two children with fragile X syndrome, one with autism. Lucas was never tested and his doesn't seem like he has um, his, his son was also not affected, but Brooke decided not to be tested. And so she has a daughter, Rosie, who was not tested because her mother didn't want to participate in the testing. But then when Rosie had children, two of her, both of her children had fragile X syndrome. So Brooke is affected and Rosie then was determined to have the premutation. And then Maggie, who was the daughter of Lucy, she has three children, two children, one with a premutation and one with a full mutation and autism. So if you count up all of the people who are affected, it's 13 descendants of, the, of Charlotte and Cooper. Cooper, is, Cooper was not tested. He passed away before testing, but Charlotte was tested and she was negative. So chances are Cooper had the premutation and passed this through the family. Um, but So this is a complicated pe pedigree, but not at all an atypical pedigree in our cohort. Um, that we've been following for the past 10 years. So there's family-wide effectiveness. And then there's all these ethical considerations which are not at all unique to Fragile X about when one member of a family is identified as having a genetic disease. Some family members want testing, some don't want to have testing. There's questions about the impact on unaffected siblings and there's questions about the impact of unaffected siblings in these families and their role and what's very important to me, especially as a family researcher, to think about the family support needs. So part of what we did is a daily diary study um, inserted into the middle of this 10-year longitudinal study. And this was a paradigm that we borrowed from a national study called MIDAS, Midlife in the US, which is a nationally representative study of 7,000 Americans. And it's collecting, um, it's a study looking at daily stress and daily events, and the goal is to link it to um, Cortisol fluctuations, which we did um, as well, but I'm not going to necessarily have time to talk about the cortisol today. But the daily diary study was really instructive about what life is like for premutation carrier mothers of children with fragile X syndrome. So on eight consecutive days, there was a phone call made 
to the mother in the evening and in that 15 minutes she was asked a series of structured questions about how she spent her time, the minutes and hours at work, doing chores, doing errands, recreation, childcare, etc. cetera, what, what stresses she experienced each day, what positive events she experienced, what her mood was like, and her physical health symptoms. And we were able to match the premutation carrier mothers in our study very closely with mothers of children who didn't have a di diagnosis or a disability within the national MIDA study on all sorts of socio-demographic factors um, that hopefully made them a good comparison group to reveal how the daily life experienced by these mothers diverged from daily life in general. So here's a few of the snapshots of the differences. The blue bars are the mothers of children with fragile X syndrome and the other color, brown, it's a comparison group. And this shows you the percentage of days where the mothers reported feeling fatigued at the end of the day and also when they experienced intrusions into their workday and there's a significant elevation for both the mothers of children with fragile X syndrome, um, feeling fatigued and in having intru workday intrusions compared to the comparison mothers. This is the percentage of days when mothers experienced, when they had, ar were in arguments or they chose to not, to avoid an argument, to not pursue a point. You all know what I'm talking about. You could let it go even though it burns you up inside. Um, or it might, and both of those dimensions or um, criteria of stress were significantly elevated in mothers who had a son or daughter with fragile X syndrome versus the comparison mothers. Particularly avoided arguments, you know, that were even higher, more than 20% of the daily diary days. Um, then we asked about specific stressors, stress at work, stress at home, and stress experienced by a loved one, a friend, or a relative and that they were also significantly elevated in terms of the proportion of days of the diary study where the mothers of children with fragile X syndrome experienced stress of each of these types, particularly stress at home. Again, that's not surprising, but when you start adding up these different sources of stress, um, different feelings of fatigue, intrusion, it really does begin to th feel like a different life. These were some health symptoms that were um, probed at the end of each day of the diary study and there's significant elevation in the carrier mothers compared to the other mothers in headaches, backaches, that's spelled wrong, sorry, muscle soreness, fatigue. Um, so there was a significant elevation of sort of general symptoms. Um, and then just for the carrier mothers, not for the rest of the comparison group, we asked the, what each day whether their son or daughter had at least one episode of behavior problems that day. And w this is giving you the picture of what during the eight days, the prevalence of episodes of behavior problems. 16% um, of the moms reported on the full eight day cycle, no behavior problems. But the rest of them had some level, 40% uh, had, their son had or daughter had behavior problems on one to four days, but the rest of them um, had behavior problems at least five days and 14% of their children had behavior problems every day. So this is not yet another source of stress exposure that these mothers experienced. So they had elevated fatigue and they had intrusions into their workday and arguments and avoided arguments and stress of all types, exposure to their child's behavior problems and elevated daily health symptoms. But all of these mothers were, and they had atypical cortisol patterns, which I, did, I thought I didn't have time to tell you um, about, but they did flattened cortisol profiles. But they were all reverse ascertained from their child with fragile X syndrome, so we don't know the extent to which these daily symptoms um, were representative of what premutation carrier mothers in the general population, either who don't have a child with a disability or who, who has the child, um, whose child with a disability hasn't been diagnosed with fragile X syndrome and included in the research literature, whether these are characteristic features for them as well. So the unanswered question, as I raised before, and I'll continue to raise for the remaining moments of the presentation, is is, this, is there a premutation phenotype that's a direct effect of the biology of the genetic variant, or is this a reaction to stressful parenting, or is it an interaction between the two, which is actually what I think it is. <laughs>
So we returned to the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study because we were able to probe that source of data having used CDC money to assay CGG repeats in all of those individuals. And in the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study DNA samples, we surveyed, as I, we assayed 6,747, as I mentioned before. There were 30 premutation carriers who had um, 30 premutation carriers, 20 females, 10 males, and we matched them with controls who had fewer than 41 CGG repeats, and we matched them on gender. They're all the same age. They're all born in 1939, so, you know, and they're all high school graduates, so we don't have to match them on education or on age because of the structure of that study. And, import, and then we checked to see if they were similar in many other ways, and they were very similar in IQ and years of education beyond high school and employment status. Importantly, no WLS respondent knew anything about Fragile X syndrome or their genotype because it was banked. It was determined from banked DNA. So we thought this was a, a really good test that was of the premutation phenotype, even though it was very underpowered with only 30 premutation carriers. Um, but they were not subject to ascertainment bias. And there are a few, this WLS is a survey, so it's self-report questions. And some of the questions were you could match up with premutation symptoms, like facts test symptoms included dizziness and faintness and numbness and ach aching muscles. Um, there's controversy about whether depression and anxiety is associated with the premutation, as I told you. There's facts poi is associated with earlier menopause. Um, and also, we, of course, had to look, given who we are and what we do, at whether they had a child with any kind of developmental disability or mental health problem. So this is what we found. Um, there was a sharp increase in this tiny population of the self-report of dizziness and faintness, um, almost 18% versus 4% in controls. Uh, look at the difference in numbness. It's about more than a quarter of them had feelings of numbness versus um, half, half that number in the controls, both significant differences. And although facts poi is technically a menopause before age 40, these women, the women, the 20 women in the WLS had their last period about three years earlier than the controls. So it was suggestive. Um, we also unexpectedly see, saw a higher risk of divorce. Um, and since the WLS is repeated measures, we looked at it in, the, in their 50s and we looked again in their 60s, and that was a significant difference both times. And there was a trend toward having more children with disabilities among the premutation carrier mothers. Intellectual disability, learning disability, major depression, bipolar disorder, and alcohol and drug problems, where a, almost a quarter of the premutation carriers had children with disabilities versus about 10% of the general population within the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study. And again, this is not just childhood onset disabilities, it's including depression and bipolar disorder that could have been older onset. So we saw this as partial confirmation of the clinical literature on the premutation with some indication, self-report, not clinical data of facts tasks and facts poi type symptoms, but there wasn't elevated depression or anxiety uh, and more children with disabilities. But we thought that this was a good first step toward using population data to answer a question that we think has significance. And we, of course, in our limitation section, talked about the need for replication like we all do. And I'll show you some of the replication data. Um, but before I go there, I want to tell you about another thing we did with the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study because we couldn't help ourselves. Um, I mentioned that the lowest number of CGGs was nine. and if so the population mode, which is such a big, robust mode of 30, nine is so little. Um, and what we couldn't, we have all this data on these people in the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, and so we had to look at whether a small number of CGGs um, deviated from normal as well. And for a while, we called them low normal CGGs, just to be not controversial. Now we call them low zone, just like the gray zone. Um, so actually, there's pu previous publications about low numbers of CGGs in fMR1 um, from the reproductive endocrinology literature. 
There's a researcher, Weghofer, who has cross-tabulated fMR1 CGG repeats with BRCA1 and 2 mutations and published a number of papers about his cohort. Um, and his observation, based on the significant associate, the associations that he observed with this cross-tabulation, was that almost that the carriers of the BRCA1 and 2 mutations that he saw in his reproductive endocrinology clinic almost always had low numbers of CGGs. And his conclusion, which is a very powerful statement in this paper, was that he f inferred that BRCA1, he did more than infer, he stated, but I think it's an inference, um, that BRCA1 and 2 mutations must be embryo lethal unless they're rescued by low fMR, fMR1 CGGs. That was his statement, and he reported higher rates of BRCA1 and 2 related cancers in these women who had low numbers of CGGs on their fMR1 gene. Heterozygous, one normal, one low, is what he, and other studies have not replicated the cancer phenotype. But so that's sitting out there. Since I was reading, trying to read everything I could about low numbers of CGGs, I read his papers. So we use the WLS to estimate the low numbers of fMR1 CGG repeats um, and reported phenotypic associations since 2014. And we, of course, there's no real definition of low. Um, there's no biology, there's no clinical observation, so we just reverted to statistics out of want of anything else. Um, so we said anything below two standard deviations below the mean, we're going to call that low. <coughs> So that's 24 CGGs in the WLS. And there were 341 men in the WLS who had less than 24 CGGs, which is 11 percent, not so rare, and 46 women who had low numbers of CGGs on both of their X chromosomes, and that's just 2 percent. But we didn't want to be dealing with heterozygous women and heart, the difficulty of interpreting those results. So we just figured, okay, we'll go for homozygous low CGG women. And we compared them with people in the normal range within the WLS on measures of cognition and mental health and cancer and whether they had children with disabilities. So this is what we found there. And I'm not going to show you graphs of the data, just summarize it for you, but it's published. That the men and women at the age of 71 self-reported that they had more difficulty with daily cognitive functioning, specifically more difficulty remembering things and solving day-to-day -day problems. The women with low CGGs were six times more likely to have the perception that they need to drink more to have the same effect. And Wisconsin is a drinking culture. I mean, it is a high rate of, I don't know, if I, well, alcoholism for sure. And six times more of women in their 70s reporting that is, we thought that was, um, remarkable, or at least worth mentioning. Um, and women had elevated rates of breast cancer, um, two and a half times higher than the controls, women with low CGGs. And both men and women had a significantly, both men and women with low CGGs had a significantly greater likelihood of having a child with a disability. And this is, these are the disabilities that we saw in, or that were ascertained within the WLS. ADHD, learning disabilities, seizures, intellectual disabilities, bipolar disorder, and suicide. So this is very preliminary and very tiny sample again, but you know I felt worth putting out there and maybe expanding that spectrum of the fMR1 CGG distribution to include not only normal gray zone premutation of fragile X, but maybe low zone as well. Okay, so I want to finish up by telling you our current research um, on fMR1 gene variations and bring it back to population level data. And we're working with a new data source, new for us, but not new in existence, um, called the Marshfield Wisconsin Clinic um, Personalized Medicine Research Project, PMRP. And PMRP um, is a stable co population of 20,000 adults who volunteered to participate, um, it's, it's not a random sample like the WLS is, but it's 40% of the eligible adults in the Marshfield area. It was, um, they started enrolling participants in around 2000. And early on, the Marshfield Clinic um, digitized their electronic health records going back to 
about 40 years. So there's a lot of um, EHR electronic health record data available on these individuals and DNA samples on all of them. And 99.2% of them consented to, a, no, they all consented to allow sharing of de-identified data from the electronic health record and DNA samples for research. And 99.2% of them said they would participate in additional studies. If, or at least we could contact them to ask them. And I say we, it wasn't me. You know, this were the people in Marshfield who had the vision to do this and got NIH funding for it. But we still had money from our CDC funding to assay these 20,000 people, um, and we did for fmr one CGG repeats, and we were able in another Caucasian population in Wisconsin, but not overlapping with WLS, to confirm the prevalence that we saw um, that I told you about, one in 60 women, that was one in 151 from WLS, one in 160 here, one in 353 men, which is a little more prevalent than we observed in WLS, and the gray zone is about the same prevalence. So now we have three studies, the Tassone study and our WLS study and our Marshfield study with indicating what the prevalence is in Caucasian populations in the U.S. of the premutation. And all of these adults in the Marshfield Clinic that we assayed were not reverse ascertained. So again, they don't know anything about their genotype. They're not biased. This time we have the opportunity to really do better phenotyping because we have access to their electronic health records going back many, many years. So we have a R01 to study them and also to bring them into the clinic and to do some direct assessment of them and also some funding to look at the low zone within the Marshfield population. So um, I've said a lot of this already, but in the, pre, in the electronic health record, I, there are ICD-9 codes, as you all know, until 2012, and then ICD-10 codes, and they're harmonized with SNOMED codes. Um, and so with the help of a wonderful graduate student, Arizu Mogavar, who is a machine learning expert, um, She's conducted random forest um, uh, machine learning to differentiate premutation carriers from controls in the Marshfield population. There are 98 premutation carriers within the Marshfield population, of whom 72 are female. So she focused first on the female, but we are looking at the males now. And then she did FIWAS. So FIWAS is sort of the opposite of GWAS. In GWAS, you know a phenotype and you search for genes that are correlated with it. In FIWAS, you know a gene, and you look for the phenotype that's associated with it. It was developed at Vanderbilt. So she is, was using FIWAS with this known variant, premutation of FMR1, to search for dis or discover or rediscover the phenotype that's been published in the clinical literature. And that's the goal of FIWAS, is to discover or rediscover. Discover new phenotypes or rediscover clinically observed phenotypes. So you know what the key question is. Is there evidence of any kind of motor phenotype or reproductive phenotype or psychiatric phenotype in these premutation carrier women who don't know that they have a premutation, don't, haven't gone to a Fragile X clinic, et cetera? Or is it really a normal variant other than the risk of having a child with Fragile X syndrome? So this is the result of the FIWAS, and the, it's really little and hard to read, and so let me tell you what's in that circle. Circle are codes. Well, first I should tell you the blue line is the 0.05 line, where the, those with a premutation are elevated above those of the normal range of women, and the red-pink line is 0.01 level, and the only words there are associated with 0.01 elevations. Um, what you see is possibly a motor phenotype, the result of it, because there's fractures of the upper limb. There's rotator cuff capsule sprain, fracture of radius and ulna. Um, there's neuralgia, neuritis, radiculitis. Whether that's at all related to fax tests, we don't know. We don't know whether these fractures are a result of falls, but they might be. And these are at age 40. You can look at people at age 60, at age 80, or lifetime codes as well. Um, but we thought that's worth studying more as potentially indication of the motor phenotype. Stronger evidence is here, where you see in these women, 
significant elevations of irregular menstrual bleeding, dysmenorrhea, and infertility, indications of FAXPOI at the age of 40. And then the psychiatric phenotype, agoraphobia, social phobia, and panic disorder is, is elevated here in this population. So, you know, there's this controversy. Is this just a reaction to stressful parenting? Is it an association of the direct effect of the premutation? And I have to say, when we wrote the grant and eventually got offended, because that was a journey in and of itself, um, I, I didn't know what we would find, and I felt no matter what we find, it would be important, because if we found that this was a normal variant with no clinical risk other than having a child with fragile X syndrome, that was important to reassure families who may be affected. If we found that there was a phenotype, that would be important because there may be actionable items that emerge from the electronic health record analysis, as well as this clinical phenotyping that we're doing. And I think what we saw was by delving into the full range of fMR1 CGG repeats that we discovered that variants that previously were, were potentially considered normal may have phenotypic associations. We've only looked on the high end at this point. We haven't looked at the low zone using these FIWAS methods and the electric, electronic health record, but this is potentially relevant for, populate, for precision or personalized medicine um, in terms of reproductive planning, in terms of avoidance of stress um, given the psychiatric phenotype, in terms of, I don't know if avoiding risky sports is such a profound thing, but if there is a greater risk of injury after falls, there may be um, things to avoid there. We've, but mount, the repeat disorders of which Fragile X is, you know, one, um, we, initially the notion was that it's only the expansion that is of significance and that below a certain level it's normal and it's not really worth looking at variation associated with variation below that bright line. Maybe the line's not so bright. Um, and so I don't know that anybody has looked at any other, I've looked in the literature, not that I know anything about Huntington's disease or Friedrich's ataxia or other repeat disorders other than poking around in the literature, but I haven't seen any other studies that have looked in that normal range. And I think um, it certainly has maybe when we think about personalized medicine, it's got to, we've got to enter into that normal range to look at variants to understand what personalized medicine might mean for us in practical terms. Um, we recently saw some evidence of increased um, adverse reaction to drugs in the carriers. And so we're looking into that because that's certainly actionable, especially if the drugs that they have adverse reactions to are related to each other. Um, but in order to take this to the next step, there has to be population screening, which in and of itself has huge ethical, financial, legal, practical implications, and also genetic counseling. Um, you know, where are we going to get all the genetic counselors to help out with this? So. I'll just leave you with this image. This is from the uh, Marshfield data of the histogram of number of CGG repeats, the red or female. So we, we, in this histogram, we modeled both alleles. Um, and you see, and the blue are the males, and you see 30 CGG repeats, that huge mode, and just hovering a little bit above and a little bit below. That's just the majority of the population. And then it tapers off in the expansion end very quickly. You see 40 is another little mode up there, 40 repeats. And that's sort of where we think normal ends, and 41 is where instability begins. Why is there a mode there? And then when you look down toward the low re repeat end, seven repeats in Marshfield is the lowest for both ma males and females. And there's a big mode at 20 and another at 23. So we're going to try to zero in on those modes to see if we can learn something more from them. And there is a similar histogram published in our first WLS paper, Wisconsin Longitudinal Study paper, that looks just like this um, in terms of what, how the population is distributed. I don't know enough about population genetics to know how, whether these modes are typical or atypical, but. So let me just end with a couple of comments about who did this work. Um, May Baker did all the CGG re repeat assays in the WLS and in Marshfield, which is a huge amount of work. She's at our state lab of hygiene. Um, Murray Brilliant is a brilliant man who is 
um, well named. He is the director of the Personalized Medicine Research Project at Marshfield Clinic and a wonderful colleague um, and friend. Matt Maynard was a postdoc who was an epidemiologist who led this effort on the epidemiology of the prevalence of the premutation in the gray zone. And I mentioned Ari Zhu before, who is the machine learning wizard who has been helping us with delving into the range of fmr one CGG repeats, as well as doing some work on autism uh, spectrum disorders. And we've been very fortunate to have funding um, from the NIH and a little bit from the CDC. So with that, I'll um, end, and maybe we have a few minutes for some questions.